Good day, everybody. It is January 19th, 2023, and we are just getting into our first macro dashes of the year after our uh, initial prognostations for the year in which I said, I believe that the S&P 500 gets down to around 3,000 as a base case and ends the year at around 4,000 as my base case. Things could be better or worse, depending on the Federal Reserve and international events. One of the international events that we saw recently is Saudi Arabia once again mentioned that they may take trade in currencies other than the dollar. But we've known that a long time. So where are we today? Interest rates are going to be higher for longer, and it is unlikely that you see interest rates come down much, if at all, this year on the short end. The long end, on the other hand, is another story. And there's a very good reason why the long end is low right now, and we'll get to that in just a second. But the reality is that the focus on interest rates is wrong. It's been wrong from the beginning, wrong for different reasons, as that narrative has evolved from wrong just on outlook to wrong based on understanding of economics and bond yields and bond markets. So what really matters? It's quantitative easing and the quantitative tightening and its impact on the U.S. Treasury market. Over the next five years, starting this year, the United States has to refinance about $3 trillion of maturing U.S. Treasuries, a trillion dollars this year and about a half a trillion the next four. So why, in that scenario, would the Federal Reserve be tightening? And what is the impact of that tightening on the stock market and real estate markets and bond markets? Let's take a look. First off, I've been talking about the Federal Reserve and how it would impact markets since November of 2021. And that's when inflation really started to catch fire. So I wrote in a previous macro dashes that inflation is transitory, which it's proven to be, but most prices are permanent. Pretty simple. We got a period of inflation that ran hot, lifted price levels, and now most of those price levels are going to be sticky. Over a long period of time, we will see disinflationary forces create a more deflationary setting as the boomers get older and older, but of course are offset, as we've talked about a lot of times, the millennials just entering their peak earning and spending years. So in the United States, it's different than it is around the rest of the world among the big economies. Japan is ancient and low resources, but they have showed us something that we are using. Europe, very old not quite as low resources as Japan, but quickly transitioning to alternative energy, which is going to be an advantage for them in the intermediate term. Ultimately, who knows what's going to happen 30, 40 years out, but I will go with that for the rest of my lifetime, Europe will be choppy economically with slow growth forever. A theme that I started writing about over a decade ago and Market Watch, when I said that the dollar would eventually trade in parity with the euro, And we would try to keep it roughly there. Well, that's where we are now. The dollar and the euro are roughly in parity. There's a lot of good geopolitical reasons for that, just ask Russia. So now we're at a higher stair. So think of the inflation as a step up to a new price level. That's all that really happened. And here we are about a year and a half after the inflation started. The year over year numbers are showing inflation handles in the threes. I've told you that they'd get down into the twos this year. The comparable starting in March suggests that it might happen before that. I was thinking around Labor Day, it might be by Memorial Day, but then we go into spending season and driving season and travel season in the United States, so maybe it is Labor Day. Regardless, sometime this year, inflation will have a two-handle again. And in a few years, as those last baby boomers get onto Social Security and Medicare, we will once again be talking about deflation. 2026 to 2030, somewhere in that time range, depending on circumstances and which study guessed right. Also talked about how the market was overvalued in 2021, overbought and over leveraged while the Federal Reserve started to tighten. What could go wrong with that? Well, we've seen it. We saw a 20% correction off the top of the S&P 500. And right now, financial conditions suggest that we see more correction coming. Get to that in a second. Just a few weeks later, I said the Fed is reloading its bazooka for the next time. The next time what? The next time something breaks. And I don't think we're close to something breaking. However, I think it is fairly likely that the Federal Reserve 
doesn't back off on tightening financial conditions until the repo market starts to show a lot of stress. In 2019, we ended quantitative tightening going into September because the repo market started to break. That's when we saw repo rates jump to 10% overnight. Basically, give me $1.10 for a dollar for overnight. And the Federal Reserve had to start quantitative tightening again, excuse me, and the Federal Reserve had to start quantitative easing again in September of 2019. Literally a couple months, just a couple months after quantitative tightening. So that was your pivot. And I think we're going to see a similar thing here. The Federal Reserve is going to continue quantitative tightening until the repo market starts to break. And when it does, it's going to flip. It'll end quantitative tightening or cut it back. Not sure exactly how the mechanism will work, but there is a trillion dollars who remembers me talking about this. There's a trillion dollars sitting at the Fed earmarked for repo market bailouts. And as I said last week, it is unlikely that we see the Federal Reserve really do much until it has to, even with inflation numbers coming down. Because ultimately, what is the Fed's number one job? Just to pound this in and to inform the new people. What is the Fed's real number one job? Somebody can protect, put it in the chat. Once again, Teresa and Vince, protect the dollar. Why is that important? Again, Saudi Arabia just suggested that maybe the petrodollar is ending. We've been talking about that since 2017, that it was coming. But it's a slow moving train. It's not a bullet train. It's like one of those coal fired engine trains. It just kind of chugs down the tracks. International currencies are diversifying, what has been one of the themes I've talked about, the role that Bitcoin plays in that, in the emerging markets. China wants it to have something to do with the yuan, a lot of moving parts. But ultimately, the Fed is doing what it has to do to protect the dollar because it was afraid of inflation. Now China is reopening, and there's an article on Bloomberg today where they basically say, oh, you know, we were just kidding around with this whole wolf warrior thing. Everybody wants to just make money and be happy. Let's get at it. Kumbaya, mothers. As I stop myself, I feel very proud of that. So I gave you my outlook. Told you that it was going to pull back in stocks and real estate. I've talked to you about my conversations with private equity firms. The 50 million to 500 million types, not the billion plus types. That's where my connections are. You know, families in several cities that I know who are worth eight and nine figures. And those are the types of families that invest in local real estate and redevelop it because they have the ear of the big insurance companies or the mayor or the county executives, and they know what's getting built and they, they kind of direct the program. So in your city, think about what's gotten rebuilt and what hasn't gotten rebuilt and who was invested nearby, who bought on that block a year ago. Those conversations are very interesting to me because it reminded me that most real estate, most commercial real estate are on five-year notes. A lot of those are coming due this year. About 17% of REITs have to refinance their real estate or part of their real estate. And because it's a five-year reset, it's roughly 20% a year of real estate gets refinanced on the commercial side. It's a little on the low side, just below 20% this year, It'll be above 20% the next couple of years. If interest rates stay where they are, give or take, and only come down a little bit, that means there's a lot of pressure on real estate because when those refinancings come, on the commercial side especially, because their occupancy rates are much, much lower now than they were five years ago and the rents aren't as strong, there's going to be a lot of sales in real estate. There's going to be a lot more giving the keys back to the bank. So this real estate cycle probably has two to six years to play out. It's not going to happen overnight. So all these people who are telling you buy REITs right now, you better be highly selective and know exactly what you're investing in because you don't want the malls for all the same old reasons and the fact that they need a ton of redevelopment. And you don't want office towers in most cases because they're looking at 50 and 60% occupancy right now. We talked about how Austin had the highest occupancy at like 65%. Even in Manhattan, it's not quite that high. So if you're a REIT investor and you get hyped up by these articles that you see about how REITs outperform, which isn't true, it's only the top couple sectors of REITs that pull the whole thing up. Some of the specialty REITs, some of the industrial REITs, some of the storage REITs, and certain markets on the residential side. And that pulls the entire complex's aggregate numbers up. But if you peel out, right, because there's 11 sub-segments of REITs, I believe, 10, 11 right in there, the bottom half, just like in the S&P 500, isn't so good. Why did I segue into REITs? Because 
it has a direct correlation to what's going on in the monetary markets and the financial conditions index, right? How tight are financial conditions? So let's take a look at that. This is from Thomas Lee. It'll be a little bit clearer in the article that I'm writing. And it shows how financial conditions tightened. We got a little rally off the bottom in October 2022, and now they're tightening again. Tom Lee speculates that we we'll probably see loosening again, but I don't think it's from this point. I think we see a roughly a double bottom, which he allowed for, before we see loosening in financial conditions again. And why is that so important? Again, it has to do with real estate and longer cycles, but it also has to do with the shorter term cycles in the stock market. What do we know about trader narratives? Well, I have told you over and over again, avoid the middle of the market. Why? Because traders have power when there's cheap margin, plentiful cash, and the madness of crowds can whip around prices. That's what this was. Madness of crowds with cheap money and margin. Everybody believed that they were a superstar trader. Interestingly, a lot of them still believe it, even though they've lost a ton of money and they don't really own any long-term assets that will rebound. They trade in and out, they lock in their losses. They don't hold on to their stocks that look like they're going to triple or quadruple or quintuple in the next several years. Eventually, margin becomes less cheap, cash is less plentiful, and the traders lose control. The first sign that a bear market is coming is when big money stops investing and takes some profits. Institutional Investor and a number of other publications noted that started to happen in late 2021. I like to follow the family offices. I think that they're the canary in the coal mine. When your eight and nine figure families start to sell and lock in gains, they choose to pay some of the taxes that are deferred while you hold, that should tell you something. Why would they pay a 20% capital gains rate if they don't think that they're at risk of losing over 20%? They wouldn't. So when you see the family offices start to sell, and these are connected people in your cities, you should ask a question, why are they doing it? It's because they see the valuations are close to the top and it's worth it to them to pay the 20% tax. And if it's real estate, they may avoid the tax with a 1031 exchange. So ultimately financial conditions will loosen again. But this is as loose as they got in 2019. This red line is actually fairly normal. You take this chart back further and further, which I can do for you, what you see is that we don't have to get way up here or way up here again. This moving average is probably about as loose as it gets, unless we have something really spectacular happen, like an international crisis or inflation becomes entrenched. That's what this period was, inf entrenched inflation probably not going to see that again. Why? As we've covered, although energy is going to be tighter for the next several years, by the middle and the end of the decade, energy is going to be getting very cheap again. Between panic pumping and added capacity from alternative energy and EVs, the whole shift to electrification, energy is going to become cheaper. And it's going to get very cheap in the 2030s, which should offset many of the expenses with the aging of the baby boomers. So when you look at this, depending on how you scale and the duration that you look at, chart looks different. There's a little room left for us to tighten. Definitely could get down into this range. I don't think we will. I think that right in here, which corresponds with this chart, it's probably more likely. So a double bottom. Can it break through? And these two charts measure slightly different financial conditions index. One is the Chicago Fed and one is Goldman Sachs. But they're pretty close. Could it get down in here? It could. And that would probably be the Armageddon zombie apocalypse that I told you could happen, but is not my base case. If you go to the NASDAQ website, you can play around with the maturity lengths of public debt and a lot of other things. I mean, there really is a lot of data over here at NASDAQ. Just sign up for a free account and you can play with all sorts of data sets. What you can see is that there's about $7 trillion of one to five year debt. Now that includes what just came on the market too. So you're going to see, like I said, about a trillion dollar free finance this year, half a trillion in the next four. Why would the Fed keep financial conditions tight? What does quantitative easing do? What does quantitative tightening do? Well, we have an inverted yield curve right now. Quantitative tightening leads to that. That means that the long-term rates, and somebody asked a question about this, long-term rates are lower than the short-term rates right now. 10-year treasuries and 20-year treasuries aren't as expensive as doing one-year and two-year notes right now. So during the crisis that we had with COVID, they issued all that money, they printed all that money, they borrowed all that money. 
The reason they use short-term interest rates is because short-term interest rates are zero then. So you raise the long-term, you make it look like a recession, you invert the yield curve, and now you can extend the maturities because the long-term debt is cheaper than the short-term debt. So people ask, why didn't the government refi when interest rates were recently near zero? They did. The short-term rates were zero. The long-term rates weren't. Take a look at 10-year interest rates. They never got down to zero. It was always cheaper to do the shorter-term debt and then refinance it later because we can manipulate the market through the Federal Reserve. That's our weapon for manipulation. Just like oil is Saudi Arabia's weapon for manipulation, China's weapon for manipulation is supply chains and possibly stealth biological weapons that cause a disease that kills old people. Russia doesn't have any stealth weapons. They just blow shit up. So quantitative easing, QE, lowers demand for treasuries because the Fed is buying them and that lowers the interest rates. Quantitative tightening raises demand for treasuries because the Fed is not buying them and that raises interest rates. And that's why, and I'll include this chart when I get it. Actually, I have it right here on another screen. That's why demand for U.S. securities has gone up as interest rates have gone up. So we're getting a lot of financing out of the rest of the world, excluding Asia, because that's China. So the rest of the world really wants our bonds, especially Europe. So Europe in particular, and I think ultimately most of the world, wants our bonds when the interest rate is a little higher. Why? Because our bonds are the safest in the world. And if they can actually get a yield that's higher than they can at home, they'll buy them. Now, these dynamics are fluid. They're cyclical. They're dependent on circumstances. What is one of the things that we learned in the last week? Again, I've mentioned it already. Is the petrodollar is slowly going away. And that's not a big deal because oil is slowly going away. What you are about to see is $3 trillion, or about 14 13% of the U.S. debt is going to get refinanced out for 10 years or longer, quite a bit of it. And I will say once again, that's just fine because it doesn't really matter what the Federal Reserve does with their balance sheet as far as our debt goes. The Fed balance sheet is there to manipulate long-term bonds, the bond market, the global bond market. We don't need to ever pay off the Fed balance sheet because it's just money that goes back to the treasury. Who cares? It's money that we take from the left pocket and then we put it into the right pocket because of the way we cross our legs. We never, ever, ever have to pay off the Fed balance sheet. There's a zero reason that we would ever have to. Now, do we have to pay off U.S. treasury debt? Is there ever going to be a point where we should stop running deficits? Well, I think certainly there is. However, it's never been a very difficult thing to do. Bill Clinton did it in a few years. Barack Obama was on his way to doing it when he got blocked on a bunch of legislation. If we ever just get rid of the loopholes, we don't have to raise it, uh, tax rates. If we ever just get rid of the loopholes in the tax code, we run a balanced budget. We don't have to cut anything. And eventually the interest expense goes down. Again, the United States, and you better accept this or you're going to never be a good investor. The United States has such huge advantages to the rest of the world that in our lifetimes, probably not in this century, will those disappear. Until Russia and China become real democracies, and we really get to a point where there is kumbaya, and by then it won't matter, because we'll all be working 12 hours a week and you know studying science and art again, flying on spaceships. A lot of these things just don't matter because the United States is so freaking strong. By all rights, the dollar should be the strongest currency in the world. Everybody knows it. That's why they're fighting it. Our geography is better. Our labor force is better. Our government is better. Our economic system is better. And all we have to do to balance our budget, which would do what? Send the dollar up, which would hurt emerging markets and almost everybody, hence Bitcoin and a lot of countries diversifying, with the exception of Europe, because they better stay tied to us or they're in trouble until little Vladdy's gone, at least. And we'll see what happens after that. So the United States is immensely strong. The debt doesn't really matter because we just closed the loopholes, that debt goes away. We could spend a trillion extra dollars a year on education and income, um, earned income credit. And it wouldn't matter if we just closed the loopholes. What loopholes am I talking about? Pretty basic ones, capital gains, tax breaks on big amounts of money, carried interest, step up in basis, estate tax evasion. It's not hard. It's a lot of money. Just having good computers 
and a handful more people at the IRS, and then having the laws put in place to balance our budget. And I predict our economy is going to get so hot sometime in the next decade that we're going to run surpluses. Probably at that point, right around 2030, probably, when the millennials are all at peak earning, but they're starting to come off of peak spending, and more and more boomers start to die. Hear me now, believe me later. That's the way things are going. As far as as this year goes, stocks are going to continue to be under pressure because of this, and we're refinancing our debt to be longer term. These bonds will mature in the 2030s, maybe a couple in the 2040s, at a time when we're running surpluses. That's what that's what they're setting it up for. Now, can bad things happen? Sure. Could there be another pandemic? Could the aliens finally attack? Yeah, all sorts of things can happen. So when all these things play out, you're going to be able to look back and go, huh, I heard it. And there's books out there. I mean, I'm just stealing from the right people. And I'm just barely smart enough to understand what they're talking about, right? Because I wasn't the top student at my school. I played basketball and sports too. And I didn't study this thing and that thing and get all sorts of accolades like certain people who trumpet their own horn very loudly all the time. But when you read this article, you'll notice the chip on my shoulder about those people. Because those people get you to do bad things with your investments. They get you to buy and sell when you shouldn't buy and sell. Again, Shooter, who is a star trader, even he doesn't trade much of his portfolio. Trades around the edges. Try to generate some income. Try to turn a little snowball into a snowman over time. But these narrative drivers, people who tell you how smart they are, they show you one picture, but not all the picture, right? They frame it to show you what they want to show you. Those people driving the narratives prove over and over again that Charlie Munger is right, that the stock market is a way to transfer money from the impatient to the patient. So this year, at some point, financial conditions will start to loosen. It'll have something to do with U.S. Treasuries when the long end of the curve starts to go up. That means that the U.S. isn't going to want to sell that debt anymore. And they'll start bringing it back in-house. You should expect another trillion dollars on the Fed balance sheet in a couple of years. Now, they might remove a trillion first, but then replace it. It's all part of the cyclical approach that they have. How they manipulate the dollar when they need to. For a very long time, the United States has let the dollar drift lower and trade in a lower range because that was good for the rest of the world. And it was good for us. Now we're getting to a more mature economic part of the global economy. We still have one more generation of emerging markets demand growth. Won't be from China this time. Kind of in the middle of it on India. But the rest of the world, Southeast Asia and Africa in particular, are going to do that. So the dollar will come down in the next couple months, sometime this year. We'll see. I've been waiting for the TLT trade. It's not here yet. It's been close. It's been close. So sometime this year, a lot of these trends are going to reverse. When the dollar starts drifting down, and you've already got a taste of it, right? Because we bottom ticked the emerging markets trade. Now the emerging markets are, you know, having a little dip. It looks like it was about to happen because it looks like the dollar is going to keep going up, depending on what Powell says. I can't imagine that Powell slips again. I think he's going to be pretty mean next time, but we'll see. This has to do with the debt markets. This has to do with the dollar. It has to do with real estate. And then it has to do with the stock market. And the stock market doesn't really need to go up much until next year. Why? Because presidential cycle. So if this year ends about where it started, whether it goes up and then down or down and then up, or up, down, up, down, up, down, or down, up, down, up, down, up, whatever. If this year ends about where it began, we will be teed up for a massive rally Because the first trillion dollars of lengthening our debt is out of the way. And at some point, the repo market makes us flip. That's the thing to watch. Some of the kids on Reddit have that right. When the repo market starts to break, that is when financial conditions are going to get much looser. And then the stock market starts to run. Because margin gets cheaper, it gets easier to take leverage. And then everybody thinks to themselves, yeah, I am that smart. It's going up again. Those losses weren't my fault. Whatever, who cares? But as we get into more fourth industrial revolution, as alternative energy takes hold, as the revenues in technology switch more to subscription-based, right? Recurring revenues, that's where your winners are going to be. People ask me about commodity super cycle. Have you seen one of those in the last 40 years? I haven't. Do you know why? Everybody's talking about, should we buy lithium? 
Well, you just had four major copper mines, and guess what? You got four major lithium mines coming on, two in Nevada. There's no shortage of any resources, none. Are there time lags? Are there periods when we have to get the CapEx in place and spend a decade, decade digging holes? Absolutely. But we're years into that already. The only thing that's really running out on the planet that's really getting so expensive to get to that it's going to go away is gold. There just isn't much gold. And oil. That's it. And we have the technology to not need the oil anymore. Take 20, 30 years for it to all get in place. So what? Invest in sustainable cash flows that are not highly CapEx dependent. If you had just done that the last 20 years, you'd have made more money than the indexes. Just that. Just avoid the heavy CapEx companies. And I don't mean startup CapEx. You know, I don't mean just building up the company to get it to scale. I mean money that has to go in for every single widget or every single drop. So can we trade commodities? Sure, but you should probably actually trade the commodities at this point. There are periods when the stocks collapse and you can buy them then like Freeport Mac brand. But at this point, and I'm sure Shooter would attest to this, you're better off trading the commodities than the commodity stocks. With a few exceptions, the oil market is so manipulated. And now that it's in a range and probably stays there for four, five, six years, some of the oil stocks are actually pretty damn good for a while because they're buying back so many shares and paying out dividends and wiping out debt. But that's because they are in what's called a period of wind down or run out. These are not growth industries anymore. They're just sucking out as much cash as they can while they live. Marathon Petroleum Corporation bought back 20% of their shares last year. 20%. They might not even be a public company in six or seven years. Or if they are, it's with 80% fewer shares on the market. And since we're never going to build another refinery again, those refineries are going to gradually transition to the new things that we need, right? Because they're essentially chemical plants. It's going to cost a lot of money for them to do that. So when they transition away from oil, I probably won't want them for a while because it's going to be heavy CapEx to get transitioned. That's why we don't build refineries or see big changes in refining capacity. It's expensive to change. When you start thinking about the names of companies that you grew up with, you start looking at where they've been and where they've gone and where they are, you start to realize nobody's bulletproof. The only companies that are more bulletproof than others in the short and intermediate term are the ones where you can look out and say, they're going to have all kinds of recurring revenue and they don't have to spend a lot on the widget after a while once they're built. The emerging markets look very attractive, especially when the dollar is falling because that's where most of the growth is. Technology is still king, particularly technology where there's recurring revenue without having to pump money into building hardware. And the space economy is projected out at trillions of dollars a decade from now. We are in batting practice in the space economy right now. Once the game starts, you'll be pretty happy that you bought cheap because a lot of the stocks in the space economy, they can add a zero, right? They can 10x pretty quick because they're coming off of such low numbers from being oversold due to hate, which is an emotion not an analysis. So this chart should tell you what's coming. The quantitative tightening was very instructive, very simple to understand. Showed you this last week, I think. When we reduce the Fed balance sheet, the stock market goes down every single time. So when some voodoo magic tech trading witch doctor tells you that there's no correlation between the Fed balance sheet and Federal Reserve policy and the stock market, here you go last 20 years. This is what matters. And in fact, I don't have it in here yet. Oh, here I do. Sure I do. The guy that first did the study on inverted yield curves, here's what he has to say. Campbell Harvey over at Duke, I think. The gauge may be sending a false signal, which is interesting because I'm the one who invented the indicator. We're in a period of slow growth. Hey, slow growth forever, anybody? Which is consistent with the model. But as far as a recession, I'm skeptical of that. A hard landing is unlikely, but I'm saying it's straightforward. This is a valuable indicator, and I believe it is accurate in forecasting a slowing economic growth period. In terms of a hard landing, you need to look at other information like unemployment. And remember, what did Jay Powell say a couple of weeks ago? We need more people. Until we get immigration policy that makes sense, it's almost impossible to cause a recession here without just blowing everything up. And why would you do that? You wait for the repo market to start to crack, and then you reverse policy. That's all there is to it. All right. I'll take some questions off here if you got any. 
have a great day and I'll post this in a couple hours.